Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's lunchtime lecture. It's the first one back after our summer break. My name is Carrie and I'm a content writer and producer at the ODI. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Jen Person, who is the founder of Digital Def uh, Defend Digital Me, which has been advocating for the rights of the 23 million people in the National Pupil Database since 2015. Jen campaigns for safe, fair and transparent data in education in England and beyond. Uh, today's lecture will be on why common metaphors for data don't work, what it means for the success or failure of uh, delivering a sustainable data policy and what needs to change. Um, now, before I pass over to Jen, can I please remind you all to keep your microphones and cameras off during the presentation and that this talk will be recorded. Um, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions at the end. If you do have a question, please put them in the chat. Uh, and then at the end, I'll either call you out to ask Jen, or if you'd rather I read out your question on your behalf, please just let me know that as well. Uh, so without further ado, over to you, Jen. Thank you very much. So delighted to be here. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, so data is not an avocado. Um, it was a slight provocative title and, of course, triggered uh, by the outcry after the Australian property developer in 2014 uh, talked about why young people could not afford housing was because they were buying too much mashed, mashed avocado and expensive coffees. But often we hear other people and adults talk about young people and have opinions about them, but we don't often hear young people's opinions themselves. So we were really keen at um, Defend Digital Me to have a conversation that involved young people about data and with uh, the national data strategy and now, of course, the most recent launch of the national data consultation, data new direction. It's a really timely conversation to have. So um, we wanted basically to, to start thinking about the language that politicians use about data and why it matters. So today we're launching our new report. Um, the words we use in data policy, putting people back in the picture. And why is this important to us? We started today to think about the images that people tend to have in their minds when they speak about data. And it was triggered by a debate that um, both Chien Wara um, as Shadow Minister for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, and then Minister for uh, Data, uh, John Whittingdale had in Parliament in November 2020. And they struggled to talk about data in terms that joined up the various metaphors they were using. And what do we mean by metaphors? The pictures that we use to represent something else. So we started to think, what are the most common metaphors we uh, hear about data and we're all familiar with? But before I start on that, I have to say a big thank you to the people that helped us produce this. Um, the uh, youth group, the Warren Youth Project and Hull have been absolutely fundamental to, to producing um, this with their voices, testing our theories that we started out with in January this year, and also to Hattusia, uh, Alice Thwaite in particular, and the researcher, Julia Slupska, um, and uh, also to uh, the producing team that Hattusia brought on board. So I have to say huge thanks and uh, many others who are listed in the foreword of the report launched today. But our starting point, as I said, was the influence of metaphorical language. And why does it matter? Because we felt really strongly that when MPs were talking about data, they were talking about it in terms of products, in terms of commodities, and in terms of consumer language. And we realized that this took people out of the picture completely. If you do a search, data is, data is oil, you get all sorts of images. You don't get the images that are as harmful. You certainly don't get images of child labor used in oil. And if you're interested in that, that's human rights watch uh, evidence uh, there in Syria's oil industry and child labor. If you search for data is gold, another commonly used metaphor by MPs, get lots of pictures of gold as a finished end product. 
again, you don't get much discussion of how it comes to be that end product, where does it come from, and what is its labour workforce, how is it produced. So, our report, in summary, looked at the common metaphors that we're all familiar with in, in uh, data language, and we addressed three most common groupings. We found, uh, together with Julia Slupskin's um, research and a desktop research as well, the three most common groupings used by MPs since 2010 in Parliament have been allowed around liquids and fluids. So the idea that the characteristics of data is data flows and also that it becomes things like data lakes. The most commonly used metaphor is a resource or fuel. So data can be mined, data is raw, data is the new oil. It's fuel for the economy. And we did find some uses of data metaphors that looked at the body and residue, the type of uh, images that were left in your mind when, when these were used was data. It leaves a trace like footprints, a digital footprint. The questions that came out from the workshop then we tested around these metaphors were, do we think this is a good representation of personal data? And it's an important distinction. We focus in this report around personal data, data about you, about your family, about your lives, and how we felt these metaphors didn't represent that well in discussion. So all of these um, metaphors, again, sort of started to talk then about the verbs as well that we use, data harvesting, data mining. And again, young people felt this didn't necessarily represent their impression of how they felt data about them was used. The three themes that came out most strongly from our workshop um, in Hull was uh, a feeling of misrepresentation. Not only could what the data say about you not tell a complete picture, it would only be a partial story of something that happened or an inter intervention or an interaction with a public body, but it might also misrepresent the full picture. And as data built up over time, you might have a profile, for example, with police. But again, that was only one aspect of your life. The young people drew out concerns around power hierarchies and abuse of power. So because these data can be misleading, they can present not only um, part of the picture, but actually a picture which is then filled in by others. So the whole story of your life or what happened isn't, isn't told. And then we also found they, they thought very much about how data is used for good, for benefit, to help them in their daily lives and uh, in their interactions, uh, whether it was in education or in other aspects of their life, and data used in your best interests was a theme that was drawn out. But again, they started to question and analyse not only the uh, best parts of that, but also their concerns. So what did it mean when other people were deciding things about you? And very strongly came out um, in these young people between 14 and 22 was, uh, what does it mean when somebody else acts on that data? And does it therefore remove your own agency and your own autonomy? So at the moment, we look at the landscape and data with these types of mining, extractive, productive, industrial landscapes. And uh, we looked at these, these different types of metaphors fitting into what could be a vision of today's data landscape that produces data mountains, big data mountains, data lakes, and uh, is the fuel for the economy. But it's polluting, it's toxic, it has side effects, including because of the excessive feeling of mining that uh, there is resistance and boycotts and pushback. Young people talked about alternatives. How could their vision of data be still about being fuel, being part of society, part of an economy, but also being a sustainable source of information which then became considered fuel or power or a source of innovation but using more sustainable methods of um, imagery and thinking about uh, less damaging 
uh, uses of, of energy for the environment uh, and very much talking about how data wasn't then in an extractive exploitative one-way system but was actually part of a community part of a feeling that it reflected more about who you were and how you fitted into society and that these stories of your lives could be used in your your own uh, best interest but also uh, in the part of the wider picture with overarching principles were always about human rights, dignity, agency, respect, autonomy. So at Defenders of Autonomy, we came away after the workshop, uh, both delighted and uh, really quite impressed with everybody's excellent thinking, um, really deep thoughts and, and uh, fantastic work and their generosity and their time, but also with these sort of two halves of a landscape and thinking about how do we then move forwards into um, uh, the sort of future of, of the, the data landscape when these metaphors produce responses and behaviors. One aspect of data collection that is less talked about today than uh, we understand through these simplistic metaphors is that data is telling a story of your lives. This was something that young people really felt quite strongly about. Um, talking about how these uh, sort of third remote uh, product metaphors didn't reflect any aspect of their life. And they talked about how it, data was information really was something that they were doing. And behavioral activity, behavioral data produced from activity is considered labor, for example, in the research work by Neil Selwyn um, in uh, Monash University in Australia. And if we think further about the research work by uh, Ben Williamson in Edinburgh and Dave, Deborah Lupton, uh, who considered the, the concept of the datafied child, so how much data is produced about children around them creating a child that is in data, we then start to think about what happens to that datafied child in this kind of landscape, and what does it look like in a future where we're building artificial intelligence. So we've got a human child whose information is being mined, extracted, turned into machine readable information in order to create artificial intelligence. And in some ways, we're starting to think uh, next about how it is that, what does it leave, where does it leave children? If companies are creating our children in the image of AI so that companies can create AI in the image of man. In effect, trying to recreate human intelligence from existing in human intelligence. And what will that mean for children's future who are going to grow up in this environment? It's a simple question, is child labor ethical? If you look at the kinds of extractive environments that we think about when we use data metaphors, we could also start to think about how are we considering digital labor in the production of children's data. The International Working Group on Data Protection and Telecommunications on e-learning in 2017 pointed this out, how sensitive children's data is. And this is particularly close to my heart because of course we work in the, in the education sector. So we'd gone to the young people in Hull, we talked to them about the metaphors, we tested them out. We then went back and looked at Hansard. We looked at what did politicians say? And this is uh, clearer to read in our report, which I'm delighted to launch today and in online. But you'll pull out all of these metaphors that various um, members of parliament or uh, representatives in the House of Lords have said that data is, the, is fuel for the new economy, that uh, we owe it to the country and particularly our children to get this right and to get our laws fit for the digital age. But still, over and over again, these are the same sorts of metaphors talked about. And very, very rarely does the human feature in this picture. So we're asking, how can we rehumanize and reshape this political narrative on children and young people's data and its use making new laws? And it matters right now. It matters that MPs and policymakers can have ac accurate, nuanced, productive discussion and what we are finding at the moment is that these metaphors limit discussion. MPs trip over um, the difficulties in language and find that metaphors run out 
they can't go anywhere. They haven't got any um, productive next steps to be able to, to move forward that, that metaphor of data is oil in a conversation because oil cannot build a bridge, for example, as uh, both uh, uh, metaphors we used in the recent um, announcement of the uh, data a new direction uh, consultation in the, in the press recently. It's worth thinking not only why do metaphors met matter now, but who's looked at this before in history? And it was interesting when we did some of our research to actually look at some of the artists who we might consider look at information, look at the world with a, through a different lens. What is it that information is telling, was telling them in 1929 when Marguerite looked at the treachery of images? He used the um, uh, images of the surrealism uh, to, to sort of question what is real? What are we looking at? Is this uh, the real picture that we're given uh, by, by our own impressions through other people's impressions? And uh, where does that kind of leave our perception on the world and our place in it? And this is one of the questions we're getting to when we say now, if we are looking at our place in the world, we have to look at not only our place as individuals, but as society and as economy in the world. Data governance models are of course uh, under debate right now, having uh, the launch of the DCMS uh, data and new direction just last week. The question is, are we going to be trying to create something new? Are we going to try and fit this uh, new revised regime into other people's uh, designs? Are we scrapping something and, and rebuilding it? Or are we building a third way? The direction of travel is we might be building many ways if we are setting up lots of different agreements with lots of different countries around the world. And the question I think we all have to carefully consider is how and uh, what are the real costs of that when many of these um, third, fourth, perhaps other ways where we're setting up multiple different agreements with different uh, adequacy agreements might be having to build multiple ways and duplicate what we already have. There's also contradictions in current policy. There's contradictions in government research interest areas. Um, and one of the things that we have drawn out is the sort of negative picture that is drawn of children in current data policy. If we look back at the history of data policy, it's not much better. But looking back as far as uh, Terry Doughty in 2008, um, who did a lot of great work around um, children's rights and data as far back as 2002, warning that the National Pupil Database was going to be risky when they started collecting names. Uh, later in 2008, you know, really pointed out the sort of contradiction about data and children and how the stories we're telling about their lives are so negative when the future of data strategies, the future of data policy is always painted in such positive lights. And I think we really have to say, what are we doing in terms of strategy, in terms of not only communications, but actual real impacts from policies that look at children and how they will uh, be involved in them. So which landscape effectively is the UK going to choose? You know, will, we, will we continue on the same sort of path as we have right now with a sort of pr product-based, ownership-driven, uh, sort of extractive model, which will meet more resistance? Uh, we've seen that in the uh, most recent GP data grab attempts over the last year and also in the 2016 to 2018 school boycott of the collection of nationality and country of birth, which led to its uh, end? Or will we look at more involvement in more uh, sustainable methods of data use, which aren't about mining data and passing it over to others, but are actually about data access, not distribution? and looking at involving the human and the person in this story. So if we look at things, questions that come up in, for example, the uh, national data strategy, they look at things like skills and the status quo, and they talk about scale. 
we also have to look at this in context of children's lives in other things. How is this affecting, for example, their education and thinking about education? Where does this fit in in the big picture, literally? Um, and particularly right now with all the efforts around uh, AI and investment in teaching people and uh, sort of the suggestions in various other policies, including the CDEI and, and others institutes, how are we going to teach children about data, about AI, and also questions around whether and how that is sustainable? What does it mean if we start teaching about one thing at the expense of another and at what costs? The strategy framing that we have right now says we want to produce forward-looking strategy that looks at public opinion and delivers real change. Well, we need to make sure that we are really considering uh, whether that I think is a um, genuine offer or whether um, it is simply trying to find the answers that have not been uh, found until to, to today. If you look back at the last decade of public engagement from 2013 and ESRC and ADRN's work around de-identified data across uh, multiple uh, devolved nations, and multiple workshops, there are clear red lines about qu the questions about big data sets being joined up, about commercial reuse of data, and particularly around geolocational um, data. You can go to the 2013 work done uh, through Ipsos Mori and Welcome. You can look at all the workshops that were done in care data in 2014 and 15. You can look at the One Way Mirror um, public engagement that was done. You can come forwards uh, to 2018. We carried out a poll with parents uh, asking them about, about educational data and over 80% said they wanted to be asked before their pupil, children's pupil data was passed over, especially around really sensitive areas like special educational needs to third parties. And you could look at the ICO's um, work last year, the 2020 um, a survey that again found public opinion is actually going in the other direction around data sharing is becoming more concerned about how data is distributed and who is using it. There's consistency of opinion and I get consistently frustrated by the calls for more public engagement when actually I think we need to take a really thorough stock check, stock check of existing feedback see the consistencies and decide how we are going to effect those in action. So to sum up, we're going to rehumanize the political narrative and people's data. How are we going to do it? Change is not easy, but change is necessary. If you look at the research from Professor Sonia Livingston, Maria Stoilova and Richard Nadagri uh, carried out partly through funding from the ICO, over the last couple of years, children understand how data is used about them to a certain degree. And they certainly understand what it means to have agency and autonomy over their own lives and how privacy contributes to that. They want change. But will the new consultation give them the change that they want to see? Questions are around sort of trade, adequacy assessments and mechanisms questions around data subjects, the assessment of the impact assessment says will not materially affect individual rights. This quote comes from Cathy O'Neill in 2017, talking about artificial intelligence. A model's blind spots reflects the judgments and priorities of its creators. I would point out that this same statement could be applied to the policy direction of travel we have at the moment. Whatever judgments and priorities are being built into the um, national data strategy and, and the new governance models has blind spots. And I think the blind spots are particularly around how we reflect not what is going to change, but looking at what should change, what's not working right now for people's rights. If you've got young people and children saying they don't uh, really support, they can't be uh, part of this kind of data community, data society, information society that we're driving, driving them towards. It is not sustainable. And I would urge policymakers to rethink how we look at involving children in data, in the data about them, and building the infrastructure that they need to understand it. 
it's not only about skills and training. It's not about digital literacy. It's about bringing the data to them that's about them and giving them the understanding of who knows what about me? How can I control it? When can I see it? Can I make corrections? Can I get redress if there's something wrong? None of those things are enhanced in the current strategy direction. Blind spots also don't look at beyond often your own uh, small bubble. And it was interesting to, to think a little bit about the language and the language of metaphors when we're thinking about artificial intelligence as well. Um, when we're not looking at English, uh, butter, for example, in German has a gender. We often talk, we think about fairness. There's a lot in the new direction uh, about fairness. I think it ties itself in all sorts of knots in fairness because actually what fairness really means in data protection terms is have I told you what is going to be done with your data? And can I show you that what was, what was said was going to be done was what was actually done? So in the same way that children's social care uh, recommendations at the moment around machine learning is that now is a good time to stop and think, I think it's a good time to stop and think about a direction of travel for children and their data in public administrative data sets. As Michael Sanders said of the uh, What Works Center for Children's Social Care, after the pandemic, everything's changed and our data is scrambled to the point of uselessness in any case. Time to stop and think, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jen. That's brilliant. Um, so we're now open to questions. So as a reminder, please put your questions in the chat um, and we'll call you up to ask Jen. Or if you'd rather I read out your questions, please do say so. Uh, but to kick things off, I'll ask my own question. So Jen, from your talk, I think one of the brilliant things um, that came across is how insightful and engaged the young people you talk to are about data and the language around it. Um, I guess my question is, how much are young people already thinking about data or rather how proactively engaged are they with understanding data about them and how it's used? Good question. I think there's uh, two ways to look at that. One is um, from the academic research perspective. You can look at data uh, research going back several years, including, for example, uh, the work of Dana Boyd in the US, who's done a lot of work and engagement around teens and how they uh, feel about um, kind of interactions with privacy and who knows what about them. You can um, look back at the uh, 2010 work that was done by the Royal Academy of Engineers of Engineering that uh, was about pharmaceutical and health and uh, data that that children had kind of were asked about work in workshops. So there's plenty of academic research out there. And the most uh, recent, as I pointed out, was uh, is often by uh, Professor Livingston and her team at LSE. Uh, and also Professor Lund uh, Lundy at, uh, in Belfast. But there's, I think, just a much more basic way of looking at it as well, which is that it tends to be us in this policy sphere that talk about data as a thing. And that literally we keep talking about it as a thing, whereas children don't tend ever to think about it as a thing. I mean, in the workshop, they, they mentioned when you say you know, data, the first thing they think of is how much money have I got left on my phone? It's, uh, it's much more when asked to think about data as metaphors, they'll recall how else it is used. And most commonly, they came up with great metaphors that they, just in, in speaking about it, you know, things like, um, you know, having a, an informational breakdown and, uh, you know, how do we kind of a, apply ourselves as machines and thinking about our mental health and our well-being. Um, but I think in terms of day-to-day, we in the policy sphere put too much emphasis and this is actually one of the problems on it being part of something else that is an other it's a thing that we can uh, consider separate and, and divisible from people's lives when in fact this is everyday life everything is information 
um, and so much of the sort of nuances of academic debate around what is personal data, what is not personal data. One of the questions in the um, uh, data and new direction consultation is, you know, where will the boundaries be in anonymization? These are silly questions because data is fluid, data changes, data has different characteristics at different points in time. The one piece of data about you may be personal to you one day because it's being used in a context where you can be identified. It may be one of thousands of people with the same name in a different context that may not be considered personal data when held by somebody else at the same time. The concepts, I think sometimes around you know, how we are thinking about data and how young people and children think about data are different. We need to much better understand uh, how children perceive themselves and their development and their developing personalities, their developing relationships between themselves and institutions, between um, themselves and authority, and how that information is shaping their lives. And I think that's where we could we could learn a lot more actually about how young people think about data in terms of how it affects them, what impact it has day to day is much more important than thinking about it as a product. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, and I guess one other question I had was obviously the framing for the talk was uh, data is not an avocado. Um, why do you think we do fall back on these metaphors so often and are there any benefits in using them? From the earliest of times, people have used um, images, things that they're familiar with to simplify complex, uh, complex ideas. Um, if you even go back to Cicero, you know, some of his uh, rhetoric is around images and trying to um, dehumanize people in the judicial system, talking about you know, how, how you can uh, make people seem less in order to be able to do things to them that you wouldn't otherwise do to people. And so data metaphors are nothing new. They're certainly uh, widely used. But I think what's interesting to think is which metaphors last, which have longevity, and where have they come from? It's not something we've researched, but I think it would be an interesting project, is why have these data metaphors stuck and not the others? Like, um, you know, data is nuclear waste or data is toxic that um, you know authors in the US may have may have uh, used in books or, or media but hasn't stuck and why have others become the predominant metaphors great um we've got a question from Charles I don't know if you want to share it yourself Charles or I can read it out, it's only a short one. Um, Charles asked if you could share the link to your report that you've referenced. Of course, I'd be delighted to. Um, I'll just uh, stick it in the chat at the end of the, the meeting, if I may. And I think it's probably already been tweeted in our Twitter stream as well. Brilliant. Thanks for asking. <laughs> and we have a question from Robert. Did you want to uh, ask Jen your question? Hi, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm having a few communication difficulties, so it actually might be easier <laughs> if, if, if you just read it out. Sorry, thanks. No worries, we can hear you, but I'll read it. Okay. Um, Robert says, hi, Jen, thanks for a very interesting talk. My question is not directed at children's data, but more generally, and draws on my own research regarding data subject complicity in data harvesting practices, which I've aligned using metaphor to religious rituals that encourage giving. To what extent has your work shown that personal data is not passively extracted by something given the etymology of data? Do you have examples? There's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, I think the idea around religious rituals is fascinating that encourage giving. I mean, um, there's all sorts of questions about power in there, you know, power of, of an institution, power of the community, peer pressure. Um, I um, I haven't uh, sort of got, I'm just looking at the question in more detail again. Um, what work shows that personal data is not passively extracted? Um, 
I mean, I think I think that one of the failings of data metaphors, if this is helpful to the question, is that it doesn't talk very well about data that is passively extracted. There's nothing that talks about data well from, you know, you walk past a thousand sensors between here and your train station in the city, and there's uh, CCTV and there are sensors built into the the um, uh, furniture, the, the street furniture around you, and there's uh, perhaps you know interactive advertising, and none of these metaphors work well for data in that context. Um, so I'm not sure I can answer your question, Robert, very well. Um, I'll look forward to reading your research when it comes out. Um, but I think data harvesting practices is still you know all about power, and I think it's that sort of imbalance of power that we're trying to rectify here. Great, thank you. Um, while we wait for any more questions in the chat, I'll, I'll ask another one of my own. Um, so with all this research that you've talked about in mind, this might be quite a broad question, but what would be your kind of utopia for the language we use around data and engaging children and young people? I think one of the... Um, one of the later articles I read uh, when doing this research that stood out for me is actually the one that we pulled out for this talk, which was that data is not an avocado. And it was um, written, um, I'm just trying to remember the um, author's name. I'm sorry, I've forgotten. But um, you know, it, was, it pulled out basically the idea that we have gone so far with analogies that they don't work very well. And perhaps we should stop using analogies at all. Um, and I think the the utopia is is always going to be a moving place. Um, I don't think there probably is such a thing as a utopia, but I think there's certainly a sweet spot, shall we say. Um, and I don't think that you know that the ideas around um, personal data and part of that being part of public administrative data sets um, is incompatible with uh, productive use of data within an economy. It's, um, it is part of that bigger ecosystem. And it's also important for its place in research. Um, what I think is underplayed is we have the support structures to enable research and increasingly the value is being seen in safe settings and um, you know, the sort of um, the tree settings where you can access data without having to take data away and um, increase its security and increase that sort of five safes around safe people, safe data, safe research. Um, <clears throat> but we're not talking about the infrastructure of how we enable that trust and trustworthiness to be passed on from the infrastructure in the system to the people in the system. So if I want to know that my research that my data is going to be used safely in research how do i know who's going to tell me where is it stored where's that information stored about what data you hold on me and i still think you know after 10 years of giving away national pupil data at the department for education it's shocking that i cannot get a full complete record of my own children's data I can't go to them and say, you know, if you're aged under 37 today and at any time stay educated, you should be able to ask the Department of Education, can I have a copy of my personal data that you've been storing and who have you given it to? So that is my building block towards a better future. I'm not sure it's a utopia, but those building blocks are absolutely vital. And I don't think it matters which landscape you prefer, because let's face it, there's some political choices here. You may disagree that um, green energies are the better way to deliver energy uh, for the future world. You may support the idea of data ownership as a, as a product. Whatever landscape, however, you support, it doesn't have to be binary. These can be, be multi-layered, but whatever role um, data plays in that, the person is indivisible from their data. This is personal data about people, and we can't separate the two. And at the moment, the person without being in the picture of how we, we look at the landscape means that they're not building the infrastructure that, that we need as people to be able to say, show me 
the registers of where you've stored data. Show me the algorithms register that's being used to uh, you know, make decisions about me in universal credit or in health or in um, welfare or in uh, you know national level show me how um you know decisions about me are then filtered down at local level and those sort of registers of what processes happen what infrastructure we have decision making and all of that is the sort of infrastructure that's missing to join the system the glue in the system if you like between the people and the institutions that want data to be able to flow flow between them That's that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just give a couple more moments in case anyone wants to get in any last questions. And I'll just check the chat to make sure I haven't missed any. Uh, we've got one from Gangesh. Do you, would you like to read out your question? Uh, hi, my name is Gangesh and Hope I'm Audible. Yes, thank you. Right, so I was just wondering, um, you know, in the context of community data and data exchanges, uh, there's been a lot of uh, language around stewardship and trusteeship of data. Uh, have you seen any effective analogies or ineffective ones? What are your views on that kind of a relationship being described, especially in the context of uh, young people and children? Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting, timely question. Um, because, as you say, you know, the idea of sort of stewardship and trust is, is very popular in some quarters. I think uh, we, in our research, focused on looking for the analogies around data is. So I wouldn't say that I could answer that in terms of there is or there isn't uh, analogies out there because we didn't look for them. We were looking around the nature of the data rather than the nature of relationships about the data. Um, but it might be a really interesting second project. I think the the question is, you know, even even how you describe those relationships can then affect affect um, you know how people feel about them. Um, and uh, you know, in in some ways, I think this is the crux of you know the kind of data metaphor idea is uh, looking back, and we include this in our report, that um, the sort of the idea that, uh, you know, for example, you know, how, how crime can be uh, represented is, a, is a one that was already tested in, in um, other people's research. And they sort of tested the idea that, you know, crime described as a virus had a sort of more social community public health approach response in the people that talked about it whereas crime described as a wild beast had a more policing authoritative um, you know sort of uh, negative uh, reaction to it and so how we describe these things affects the behavior and the decisions that we shape the response to that to that about so i haven't seen um you know, particular analogies around uh, relationships to trustees or stewards, I haven't looked for them. I think there probably are interesting um, parallels to draw out in um, indigenous uh, research around sort of Aboriginal um, uh, relationships to land and, and questions around uh, that kind of stewardship idea, um, but I haven't looked at it. We've got uh, another question from Robert, who says, um, I'm a little sceptical of the level of individual control of personal data that is often mooted. What does that infrastructure look like? Do people want that control? Um, great question. I think one of the examples that uh, keeps getting battered about right now, and everybody groans when they hear it, is everybody's con got consent fatigue. Everybody's fed up with having to click cookies away or accept them or reject them. And this is sort of used, I think, as a, um, to some extent, a stalking horse. You know, I'll bring in another terrible metaphor here. Um, it's the idea that if you're, cons if you're tired of consent around one thing, that you might be tired around consent about another thing, which I think is a really slippery slope to be going down. Um, it often reflects in current decisions, actually a quite limited understanding of the current 
uh, landscape around the ad tech environment. Um, you know, these these click pop ups are not there uh, to be clicked away to be a nuisance, but actually they are an indicator of how um, the data broker landscape has been allowed to get away with ad tech tracking and following our every click and our every move and sometimes you look at these if you go into them in depth there's hundreds of third parties you know i i don't give my permission to want to share everywhere i go and everything i do with all these hundreds of third parties um so i think the question of you know what does that infrastructure look like because do people want that level of control is is two parts one is why do we not have that control today and therefore whose responsibility is it to fix and i think around the cookies mechanism the responsibility is that the ad tech industry needs regulated it needs fixed the arguments have been made civil society has made them there have been legal cases the regulator in the uk and elsewhere has failed to act um, and if we just regulated that in law as it is already meant to be, rather than looking at new ways of doing it, we would find that that consent uh, fatigue went away. So I think people do want control. Certainly um, the research done with young people in all of those pieces of uh, public engagement we mentioned earlier, in the work of Sonia Livingston, for example, most recently, children do want control. And our workshop showed people want to understand you know, what effect are you gonna have on my life? why are you going to affect my life i think for children it's particularly important because it might affect you for the whole of your life and so i think uh, that infrastructure has to be manageable um it certainly has to be you know something that isn't isn't seen as a, an additional burden um but actually is at different levels you have to have you know the administrative national data sets need an infrastructure which is about transparency and about openness and about registers and tracking and just uh, which may be open and understandable to a certain set of um, people in the sector for example civil society and others then there's going to be um, things that go down to local authority level you know interactions between you and your school or your school and the local authority should be understandable and they should be understandable as a relationship who do I have the relationship with and who is, you know, the data controller gets quite abstract, but if we bring it back to who do I interact with, who has my data because I interacted with them, then they've got a responsibility to me as a steward of my data to um, be able to tell me what they've done with it. And I think, you know, that infrastructure is quite simple when it comes to some things like health or education. It could be reports on demand. It can be as often or as little as you want. It can show you what data has been collected, where has it gone, here's how to correct it. Now, these are basics. They should already exist, they just don't. And I think some of that infrastructure is uh, quite straightforward. There are examples where it does work, um, but I think at, you know, at, at national level, they simply haven't had the political will to make it happen yet. Brilliant. Um, I'll wait a couple more moments in case uh, there's any last questions. We probably have time for one more. Okay, then I think we shall wrap up there then. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Yeah. If I, if I was, I was just going to think one thing I forgot to say, I think, you know, one of the big questions around uh, the data consultation is please take part, you know, we, we've, uh, I've, I'll, I'll, I'll put the link onto our Twitter feed as well, you know, is, is I think we need greater sort of thinking around this from, from everyday people who are talking about, you know, do people want this, do they want this level of control, and I think one of the things we should think about is, uh, you know, a lot of the data strategy and things is talking about reducing risk. It's about you know, reducing uh, data protection impact assessments, having no data protection officer, reducing prior consultation, um, you know, not tracking um, exactly what data processing is going under what's called ROPA, R-O-P-A, Article 30 of the GDPR. You know, but all these things don't take away risk. The risk doesn't disappear from data processing as a result of not having the processes around it. The risk is just transferred. The risk's not reduced, it's just redistributed. 
And I think that we're looking at a situation where you know, government's quite keen on re reducing bureaucracy for, for industry and for economic partners, but we must look at it as it doesn't, it doesn't uh, reduce risk, it simply redistributes it and it redistributes it back to us as individuals. Uh, so I'd like us as individuals and collectively to get involved. And if you want to follow up with me on that afterwards, I'm very happy to. Um, and on that note, we do have a question for your Twitter handle as well. So do you want to share that before Thank we wrap you. up? Of course. Thank you. Um, great. So I just want to give a big thank you to Jen for the really interesting talk and for all of you that contributed con uh, questions. They were great. Um, Please do join us again next week for our next lunchtime lecture where we'll have Hayden Sutherland discussing what the future holds for the UK's transport system and why embracing open data initiatives is just the first step in moving to a smart transport ecosystem. Uh, but until then, have a lovely weekend and thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thank you very much.